My name is Nina Collins, as you know, I'm the Chief Creative Officer at Revel. Um, we're here today for our weekly podcast recording for Raging Gracefully, and we're going to be in conversation with, how do you pronounce your name, Bobby Rebel? Bob, you did it. Yes, yes, Yay. yes, yes. Okay, Bobby Rebel. Um, Bobby is a certified financial planner. She's the author of Launching Financial Grownups, Live Your Richest Life by Helping Your Almost Adult Kids. Um, almost adult kids become everyday money smart, which is she's a financial literary ad, literacy advocate, the host of the Money Tips for Financial Grownups podcast, and the founder of grownupgear.com. She was previously a global business news anchor and personal finance columnist at Reuters and has held various journalist positions at top news outlets, including CNBC, CNN, and PBS. I invited Rob, Bobby here because I think this is a super relevant subject for our audience launching financial grownups. It's, um, her book is kind of a call to action for parents of teenagers and young adults who want the best for their kids, but are beginning to realize that their own financial independence and financial separation from their children has to be a priority as well and is a complicated part of this. So like, how do we, um, I mean, it's something we talk a lot about in this community in conversations about raising you know, young adults is, is issues of boundaries and, promoting their independence and how much we want to help. And you know, these are complicated emotional issues as are most money issues. So welcome, Bobby. Very glad to have you here. Thank you so much for having me. Um, and the format for the event is like all of our Raging Gracefully recordings where we have an audience. Um, it's a webinar. So audience members are very welcome to write questions in the chat um, or in the Q&A. And I will monitor both. And I'll basically be having a conversation with Bobby about her book and her theories. Um, and you guys can chime in with any questions of your own. So Bobby, I have four young adult kids in their 20s. So I am like totally your audience for this book. Like <laughs> I dealt with high school money issues, college money issues. And now I'm dealing with like really young adult money issues. My kids are 28, 23, 23, and 21. And the, these money issues are coming oh my God. Up all the time as they do. In fact, my youngest child just got engaged, which so now that's bringing up a wedding and the cost of a wedding. Um, two of my kids just moved to Montana together. And so I actually helped them buy a house um, and they got their first mortgage. So I have lots of, lots of opinions about this. Um, but I want to ask, I guess my first question is, well, I want to dive in with like, how do you know if you're really fucking this up? But I think I'll start with an easier question, which is why did you write this book and what have you learned from writing it? What's been the biggest surprise? The impetus for writing the book is everything that you just said, because we can be, in your case, you've built businesses, you're doing all these things. And yet when it comes to your kids, and these are kids, these aren't kids that are problem kids. These are good kids going through life, doing their thing. When it comes, <laughs> when it comes to at times, I know, but when it comes to kind of helping them be what I call financial grownups, setting up their own independent, financially responsible life good or, you know, we all have ups and downs. It's not about having a perfect life, but just kind of in their mind, feeling like they have to take ownership of their own finances in some way. Um, I think it's really hard for parents for a number of reasons. And it's not necessarily about the money. Here I am. I was a certified financial planner. I had two decades of business news reporting. I had written a globally syndicated personal finance column. I had the information to tell them, but how do you make them listen and then actually execute the things you're telling them to do. And a lot of what I found out is you can't tell them what to do. You have to help them get to a point where they're going to decide what their end point is. And then if you're doing a good job, you'll get to be involved in helping them get to that point. Mm -hmm. So for example, I love the fact that you talked about helping your kids, you know, get, get their first home. A lot of people in, in a previous generation, unrealistic for us, might have said, cut them off at age 18, age 22. Not realistic for the vast majority of us. I'm a Gen Xer and we just don't do that. We are helicopter parents or we are in denial that we are helicopter parents in many cases, but it's unrealistic. So we have to say, how can we set them up for success in a way that they'll be okay when we're not there as their safety net? And that's really the goal. And coming to terms with that was something that I did as I wrote this book. I really wrote it for me and for everybody that didn't have an answer when I asked them. What I did have on my side, given my journalist background, was a network of experts that I was able to pull into the discussion. 
Mm -hmm. What was, I mean, I have so many questions I could ask you. I mean, you can't tell them what to do is really good. Yeah. Like parenting of young adults or parent, you know, it, it's very good advice. Like a lot of it is you're hoping you're modeling what they should do and they're learning from you. Um, but they often really do not want you to tell them what to do and they have to learn and make their own mistakes. That said, with money, there's a lot of stuff. Like my kids, there's a lot of conversation with my kids around credit scores and credit cards, mm -hmm. right? In their early 20s, like they can get credit cards and they're learning about credit scores. So how do you, you know, and I think a lot of kids in our culture really don't get financial education. I think none of us really do. Um, like we should be taught all this stuff in high school, middle school, but we're really not. Um, do you think we are? Yeah. So I would take a different approach. I would say more is more. If you can get the high schools and the elementary schools and the colleges, what have you, to teach them, that's all good. But at the end of the day, that's academic. And there's nothing like teaching them in the real world. And you gave the perfect example. Kids are learning about credit scores. That's certainly not something I was learning about as a young adult. So let's give them credit. A lot of them are actually further along than we were at that age but because they have to be they're being confronted with things like student loans like outrageous home prices and if you're not in the home like that you're going to own you're having outrageous rental prices what have you inflation where do we begin they do face tougher obstacles in many cases every person's unique but as a generation i think it's really tough out there but at the same time they are stepping up as a generation and they are more aware of things like student debt are they necessarily aware of how best to pay it down Maybe not in every case, but there is an awareness that's going on that I think sets a good foundation for a lot of success in the years to come. So I'm very optimistic. And I think a lot of the things that you said make me optimistic. That they're thinking about these things. So what are some, yeah. I know you want people to buy your book. And of course, um, do you have a copy of the book next to you that you can hold up? I actually don't have one. Oh my goodness. I don't, I'm packing. This is so bad. No, no, no stay there. Okay. I'm gonna stay there. I'm on AirPods. So wait, this is really good. I'm gonna get this. I, I have something special. This is happening, okay? But because with the podcast, I can say my AirPods are still there. Look at this. There you go. I have signage. It's like that's I have awesome. signage that I'm holding up of the book. We'll hold it back a little so you can see the whole thing for anyone that's on the webinar. So how's that? Gonna, maybe you can <laughs> give us a few tidbits of what are some of the core lessons that you learned tips that you feel most strongly about or surprises you learned when writing this book? I think the biggest surprise is that they will step up for things that are important to them. And if it matters to them, they will figure out a way. But if it doesn't matter to them, you're out of luck. So if there's something important to you, you have to find a way to make it relevant to them. And there are going to be times when you just want different things. And the glaring example in my book, and the, I think the thing that people love the most is there's an epilogue that's written by my stepdaughter. So I have two stepkids. So I have a very complicated blended family at all generations of my family. But just at my level, I've got two stepkids, 25 and 22, and then my son with my husband that's 14. And the 25-year-old wrote an epilogue for the book, which was almost a rebuttal. So during the pandemic, one of, she was living with us saving for an apartment, which she did eventually buy. And we did not help her with a down payment. She saved it. That's impressive for a 25 year old. That's super awesome. Yeah. She started at age 13. That was her dream. The 22 year old, not his dream. So every kid different. But what was interesting, Nina, is that she had this thing where she and her boyfriend decided in a pandemic living in New York city, that what they wanted to splurge on were season passes to Disney World in Florida. <laughs> and yeah. I'm sitting here going, no, 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 no. You're living at home in the, I love her, but in the best way, driving us a little bananas in the pandemic because we live in an apartment in New York City. And you're going to basically delay that to spend whatever, a couple thousand bucks in a pandemic to go to Florida enough that this is going to be worth it. And I, to this day, think that's ridiculous. but you can read not the epilogue. It's not up to me. No. And everyone can read the epilogue and read her rebuttal in her own words, but she will make the case for why she and her boyfriend bought these passes. Um, at the same time, she really wanted a puppy. She waited a year and a half after closing on the apartment because she did understand not only was there the purchase price of the puppy, 
there was all the ancillary costs that go with the puppy. So I was really proud of her because even though I still think it's a little early to get the puppy, she did wait. And she, what she did more than wait is she really priced out each thing down to, is it worth getting pet insurance? What vet am I going to bring it to? Yeah. What is the starting equipment? Everything. So those are things that mattered to her. And ultimately you that's do, where you're going to have impact. So what do you do when there's an emergency? Cause I've had these pet issues. Um, what if the pet needs emergency surgery and she suddenly has a $2,500 vet bill from the animal medical center and she can't pay it? What will she do? Will she go to you? Will she put it on her credit card? Well, she should come to me to discuss options, right? And we can brainstorm together, mm -hmm. number one, right? And then you look at the options and it may be a credit card. In that case, honestly, I would say to her, talk to the vet you know, see what they say, say, this is too big a bill. I don't have pet insurance. Sometimes just like with humans, if you go to somebody and you say, you go to the doctor, you say, I need the non-insurance price. The bill gets cut in half, sometimes more, right? Because they know there's no insurance company. And then, and, and I did this and I believe I talk about it in the book. I had three kids that needed orthodonture and each one was five figures. It was crazy. I did ask them. I said, I could throw this on a credit card. You're going to pay 3% and I'm going to be paying interest for years. Mm -hmm. How about if you set up a payment plan and you won't pay the credit card interest, mm -hmm. you won't have to pay them 3%. And I, you know, I will make the payments and the kids are getting the treatment over multiple years. It'll be paid off by the time the treatment's done. And they said, oh, we do that all the time. No problem. That's great. Mm -hmm. That's smart. Right. So, so talk to it. people in any case, we just had taxes. If you owe taxes, talk to the IRS, they'll work it out. Nobody wants to run after you with a debt collector. So if, it, if, it, if a child is coming to you with a problem that you can give them some common sense life experience mm -hmm. solutions, do that. Now, if a child is coming to you with a true immediate crisis, um, I can't even think of a scenario on the spot, but something where, oh, you know, I then of course you step in. Okay, tell me, go. Me. So they need their <laughs> wisdom teeth out and they don't have dental insurance. Yeah, this happened. This happened, well, it was the 14 year old last summer. And you know what I did? payment plan. Okay. Same so thing. You, you, it was seven well, grand. I, it was seven grand. Year old, everybody. 14 year old is your responsibility, but if it's a 25 right. year old, still a payment plan, tell them to go on a payment plan if they don't have it. Right. Yeah. Right. That's what my daughter I mean, did. She had a dental yeah. emergency and she went on a payment plan. It, so yeah. What is your advice about drawing boundaries then? Like at what point do you say I'm not involved at all? You're completely on your own. Like, how do you set that up in the book? Because ostensibly what you're trying to do is you, you, the title of the book is to kind of help, right? It's help create financially savvy, independent. Right. And you also have a real focus yeah. on preserving your own financial health, right? So you're kind of saying like, if the choice is between paying for college or putting your retirement, would you then say it's better to take loans for college? I think that's the, I think that's the accepted financial wisdom, right? To yeah. care yourself first, not them. Is that something you talk about a lot in the book? Absolutely. The truth is, as much as you may be uncomfortable with this situation where it gets very murky and maybe you're subsidizing their life, how would you feel if you, this is scenario one, you have to ask your kids for money in the future. Mm -hmm. No one wants that. Here's where it gets worse. How would you feel if you had to ask your kids for money and because they hadn't learned the financial skills that we're talking about, they couldn't even help you if they wanted to. Right. Right. So yeah. that's scary. You so every time you're over subsidizing. Right. You don't want to be in a situation yeah. where you have no boundaries, you're over subsidizing, and then they're not even learning good skills. And then they're bad at money. That's like the worst case scenario. Right? It's terrible. Yeah. It's a nightmare. So you, you don't want that. And you don't want that for them. Right. Because think about your kids, think about how we've come up and we've sort of been a sandwich generation in many ways. You don't want that for your kids elevated to a different level because they're going to be coming up at the time. You might need help from them in your retirement. They're going to be having potentially other dependents. And the worst case scenario is that you, you know, you want to be able to enjoy your life with them without having a financial stress where they worry, oh my goodness, does mom need money? What are we going to do to help her? And nobody wants that. Nobody wants that. And if you explain to them that in order for you to help them, you would have to remove money from your retirement savings. That's going to be really powerful. Yeah. Ideally, you don't have to, but at a certain point, they have to learn that we parents are in most cases, not a bottomless pit. 
And there's something, you know, it's important. Um, you want to give your kids, and I'm not the one that said this, and I'm not drawing a blank. It, it's so, there's a billionaire out there that said this, but they basically they want to give their kids enough that they can do anything, but not enough that they can do nothing. So someone in the audience probably knows who said that because it's a famous quote. It's but probably, well, it probably isn't Warren you know, Buffett. Isn't Warren Buffett something the one like that? They lived had like a. I don't think his kids knew they were wealthy their whole time growing up. I think they lived in like a suburban house and had a station wagon. So wait, enough. <laughs> I want to give them say it again. Enough that they. And, can do anything, but, but not, but not so much that they can do nothing. Well, that's an interesting quote right. because to me, yeah. I'm kind of surprised by that quote. I mean, do you really want to give your kids enough that they can do anything? Like, till right. when? I mean, yeah, I don't, I don't think no, I, I think you're right. Yeah. Now I'm processing that a little bit more. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to think of other quotes, but, but, but it's still not something to think about. Do, not too much that they can yes. do nothing. That would just be stupid. Yes. So yes. describe for us, and I'm sorry, Bobby, that I actually have not read your book yet. I kind of wanted to interview okay. you first. Um, tell me, like, what, what, do you, what would you say is the core message of your book? Like, what did you Love, learn? Oh, I think the most important thing is to give your kids the confidence to know how competent they are to run their own lives. Because a lot of the time, they aren't even asking us for help. We're offering them for help. We're offering them help because we don't necessarily believe that they'll be okay on our own. And so we over parent yep. and I want to credit, there's an author that I was fortunate to interview in the book named Julia Lithcott Hames. And she talks about that very much. And, and that's part of why I brought her into the book is that we have to let go a lot of the time it's us. And so that's why this is a book written for parents, because we are the ones that can change our own behavior we have to let go of our kids. And that's a really hard thing to do when we are a generation that is so closely identified with our kids. I mean, now look, I have a 14 year old, but when he was younger, there are actual people I knew only by their child's name. You know, it was John's yeah. mom, right? That's a little wacky when you think about it. Yeah. And we have that, I, you know, no, I, I really agree with you. I mean, so Julia lived, yeah. I can't remember how the last, the third hey. last name is spelled H A I M E S. H -A and she, her, yeah. And her most recent book is your turn, how to be an adult. Yeah. She's excellent guys. She's amazing. I interviewed her here on this podcast. She's super smart. And it is. And interestingly, Bobby, I don't think of myself as a helicopter parent. A friend pointed out to me that five years ago, if you had asked me, would I ever help a kid buy something? I would have said, absolutely not. As soon as they're done with college, I am done. But I've slightly changed my mind because I did yeah. the same thing with graduate school. Like I didn't want to pay for graduate school. But then when I was looking at one of my daughters who is becoming a therapist and is now making $46,000 a year, when I looked at her spending three years in graduate school and taking out all those loans and having those interest rates, I was scared mm -hmm. for her. And I thought if I can help her with this leg up, I will. So I have changed my mind as I've gone along mm -hmm. about what kind of help to give them. On the other hand, that same daughter has surprised me. She's 28 and she already has $30,000 in a 401k. So I feel like that's good. I'm doing some things right. How do you know, you know, what are the signs that you're really screwing this up? Oh, it did come from Warren Buffett. Wait, so but, oh, thank you. Thank yes. you. That's interesting. Wait, can I just compliment something? I think it's very important that the audience know you did something really smart. You were giving strategic help. In other words, yes, it's a little helicopter parenty in theory, but it's really not because what you're doing is you're giving support. Yes. Financial support but for purpose, right? For a purpose, because that will get your child to a place where they can then have financial independence. So that is very smart. And I think yeah, that that kind of strategic support, which will lead to not having years of debt burdens and feeling like they're climbing out. And also they'll be able to live their life. Sometimes we get so caught up in the future that we forget to live, you know, in their case, in their twenties, in their thirties, we want them to not be so stressed out with money that they're not really getting to enjoy this wonderful time in their life. Right. Well, I think part of it is certainly, of course, if we're smart about money and understand to your point, really what we can afford. I mean, I don't want to be in a situation where I'm asking my kids for money. Um, but yes, I, I, I feel like if I can help them in certain ways to set them up so that they don't have debt and that they can then, and also two of my kids are really, yeah. one's decided to, one's an elementary school teacher and one's a therapist. They're not going to be making much money. So I've really tried to take that into consideration. Mm -hmm. um, but 
I mean, there are obvious ways, you know, if you're really fucking this up, right? Like if they're constantly calling you for money, I mean, what are the big red flags that you're really not doing this well, if you're not teaching them? I mean, I, I really like your messages so far that they are competent and that like teaching them, that yeah. they're more, like letting them know that you believe that they're really competent and can handle everything is a hugely important non-helicopter parenty thing to do, right? Not rushing in to save them every time there's a crisis. Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think a you- big, oh, I'm sorry. No, no, I think a big, mis- yeah, a big mistake that a lot of parents make, and I have made this mistake, is assuming they know something just because they say they know something. That is Does a- that make sense? <laughs> yes, right? that's a really good one. With kids. So, for example, you might say, oh, you know you have to get renters. First of all, assuming, let's say, that they know they have to get insurance when they get their first apartment, right? Number one. But then you say to them, you're going to get renters insurance, right? They'll go, yeah. And then it's not getting done because they don't really know how to do it necessarily. So the first time they do something, I really encourage people to sit with them. That's what I've done. And whether it's for Ashley, we did her 401k together. I asked her, she got a great, great job out of college, worked so hard for a big consulting firm. She's a cybersecurity analyst. She said, I'm on it, Bobby. I remember it's my stepdaughter. I'm on it. I, I, you know, and they grew up with me, you know, teaching them all these things. So it gets a little annoying. There's a lot of eye rolls in our house. Like, yeah, yeah, yeah. I did the 401k. I'm all signed up. No worries. But I asked her to show me, show me the 401k. Mm. And sure enough, she had signed up for it, but she had not chosen an investment. So if you put money in cash for 40 years, how's it going to do? Well, you're going to lose eight and a half percent this year with inflation, right? Mm-hmm. So, and that's a big mistake. So that's not a mistake you can let your kid have. So you need to sh- see what they're doing when they say they've got it, at least the first time. So we went in and we picked an investment and I had her, you know, pressing the buttons and it is annoying. You're annoying your kids. They're going to be annoyed at you, Yeah, but well, it's that's, okay. That's a hard you know? also because a lot fine. of but a lot of us don't know the right thing to tell them. Like, I haven't looked at my daughter's 401k. I'm not sure that I'd be the right person to advise her on that. So that's interesting. I mean, your kids are well, like, yeah. That's ask someone, someone, but then ask, ask a friend, ask a friend to do it. Or, or maybe that's when you bring in a, you know, a, a financial advisor or have them, you know, and maybe you get on the phone with them. And I know this seems helicopterish, but the stakes are so high. Get on the phone with them and their HR person and make sure that they are set up correctly. Mm, because that's a 40 year mistake. That's their life. So be a helicopter parent in that case. I mean, I move into concierge parenting, which is a whole other thing, but it really behooves us to get into the weeds when the stakes are that high, especially with kids that are having good jobs that want to do well, that think they're set up correctly. And they just may not be. We used to get, at least in my case, I had an HR person that sat down with me. They gave me paper. They gave me a folder the first day, my first job, I was at CNBC everything was very formal and she went over it with me. Now they get a link to a webinar on the, on a page on their HR site, which they probably don't open or, it, yeah. you know, so you don't this, know. Right. This is tricky. Cause this, this yeah. kind of to a number of things. It does feel to me very helicopter. Like, I think if I said to my kid, I want to see your 401k link, she'd be like, no, thank you. It speaks to what you said, but you can't really tell them what to do. Like another example I have. No, for- but you can like, make sure that they're doing what they intend to do. In other words, you can say to them, did you intend to have this invested? You understand that if it's just in cash, you're going to lose eight and a half percent every year. Yes. Right. So you can, that's what you, you can't tell them that if you, just because you believe that crypto is a bad investment, it, maybe they do want to put 10% of their money into crypto. You can't tell them not to. That's right. You can make sure that that's a choice. Yes, you're absolutely right. I have a son who's very crypto crazy. Um, Someone in the audience says, if you have an advisor and she's right, they'll often offer to do a quick review of your kid's stuff. Um, My dad's advisor did did this for me when I was young and I brought my first, bought my first home in California at 28, which is awesome. Um, It's a very good point, Andrea. And it's true. My financial people have offered to help my kids and my accountant's been very helpful with my kids. So offering them whatever resources you have and talking to them about it is super important. Um, And, and by the way, it's not a bad idea. If your financial advisor is offering that, let them have a direct relationship with that financial advisor. The advisor will be thrilled, trust me, because they're ready to get their hands on the next generation's money. So there's going to be no pushback there. But for your kids, you know, you're talking about letting them have agency over their own decisions. Mom doesn't have to be involved. If they're connected to a professional that's going to guide them, 
that works too. And then they can yeah. choose to involve you to the level that they want. But at least you know someone is checking that the box they think they checked was checked. No, that's a good point. And actually someone in the audience just recommended a book that I think I'm going to tell my daughter to order. It's called The Smartest 401k Book You'll Ever Read, Maximize Your Retirement Savings the Smart Way. Thank you very much. That really is good to know about, Michelle. I appreciate it. Um, give us some more tips or biggest surprises. That's kind of what I'm interested in the most. Like what, when you go around talking about this book, what is the thing that you feel you're driving home the most for people? What's the most surprising? surprising thing for people or where do people screw up the most often? <laughs> well, they're two different. Let me start with one question. The thing that people keep telling me that they're shocked reading the book, even though it's completely obvious also is the beginning of the book is dedicated to the fact that things really are different and we need to give ourselves a break on that front because there are reasons why our kids are tied to us financially for longer. Some are good. Some are bad. Most are sort of in the middle in that gray area. So for example, well, we used to say kids were adults, we perceived it as maybe 18. And then it kind of crept up to 22 as more people went to college. And now if you ask someone, they often have kids in their mid twenties that have financial ties to their parents. Maybe their parents, like I said, are helping them with a the down payment. That might've happened a generation ago, but it would have been at age 21 or 22, right? There's, I know when I moved at home, moved home after college at 22, I was trying to break into TV news, took me till August to get that job at CNBC. And it was humiliating to live at home for three months. Mm. I thought it was so now lame. Seems, right now that's completely now. Oh my God. No stigma. It's considered generally a good thing. It makes total sense to people. And a lot of that is good, but the downside is we do have these ongoing financial ties. It's great that kids can stay on our insurance until age 26, but that also creates an expectation for parents that we have to pay in many cases to keep our kids on our insurance till age 26. And once we're paying for their insurance, well, we're probably also keeping them on our cell, cell phones, phones, which did not even exist, by the way. Car we were insurance. That I'm still paying for car, car insurance. Cell phones. Car insurance, health insurance. I mean, Netflix is trying to crack down, but Netflix, we know that I think happens. Netflix, absolutely. Right, exactly. So all these things literally were not even available in most cases when we were have, growing up I to be subsidized. Have, no, I didn't have parents right. after I was like 20. I had no one helping me with any of this. Exactly. So what everyone's saying to me is, wow, things actually are different. The gig economy, I mean, where do I start? When we had a job, we went to the job. It was like a secondary family. So we started building this friend group often beginning at work, mm, right? Interesting. I see. And now we don't me. have that as much because first of all, COVID yeah. and the gig, the gig economy, right? Yeah. So all of these things have sort of broken apart those life milestones that happened earlier that we don't have anymore. Is so it? people are fascinated when uh, these are things that are just, I didn't make them up. They're just, they exist. Yeah. But no one really put it together for them. Are there studies that show, I mean, I wonder if it, it's kind of provable that that's affecting our finances, adults' finances. I mean, if kids are living off of us for 10 years longer than they used to, that's got to be a pretty significant drain for most of America. Yeah, there are stats, and I don't want to misquote them, but there are stats in the book. And I can follow up with you for the show notes with some stats that are newer that I have, um, but I don't want to misquote them, but I want to say, I think 28%, a new study showed um, of parents um, would take money out of their retirement accounts to help their adult children. Mm. And that's staggering. And I know that over 70% of parents are willing to help their children financially, even in their twenties. So the data is there. Now the actual, it's hard to quantify how much damage that does to a specific person's retirement because our retirement needs and resources are so all over the place. Of but I know emotionally, I can say to you intellectually, I would never do that, but test me. And I'm not sure what would happen. Right. Yeah. I mean, that's what I was wondering about with like Let's the be honest. dental question or the, another one I see a lot in New York and granted New York is a super privileged environment, but I know a lot of people whose kids go to private school and it's paid for by their grandparents. Right. So sometimes I wonder one third, one third, one third. It's a big number. 
Yeah, big number. And it, it raises all sorts of questions about inherited wealth in our country. And but I do wonder again because I used to say, oh, like I really fully thought once the kids were out of college, I was done. And now I'm like, what was I thinking? Like now I have four kids in their twenties. I'm like so not done, and I am trying to get there. And yeah. Yeah. It's hard because to some degree I could be harsh and be like, well, you're choosing not to be done. Absolutely. Right? You're choosing not to be done. On the other hand, I'm also commending you because I think that is strategic help and very smart because you're setting them up to be financially independent much sooner and to live a richer life. And that's good too. And because of that, you may not have to subsidize when you have potentially grandchildren, right? Because what you don't want to have is have your, your kids paying off all this debt into their thirties. And then they've got grandchildren and they're really drowning and life is just stinks. No right. one wants that. Right. So help them you're being strategic, them. but you are also choosing. And I am being a different I generation. No, and it's important right. that I look at that. That's completely right. You know, I also think, of yeah. course, like any money issue, of course, money is completely emotional. And as mm -hmm. I said, I didn't have my mom died when I was young and I don't I'm not close Sorry. to my father. So I didn't have any financial help in my 20s from parents. Um, I right. got married super young. But so I and I have three daughters. So I feel very concerned with making sure that my daughter's learn how to be financially independent, not get married, uh, you know, for any kind of safety reasons, not depend on a man, learn to have their own money. Um, do you see a lot of people doing, making some of these decisions differently, depending on the gender of their kids? I did not, I don't have data for that. So I don't want to speak incorrectly. I can tell you that I do feel on a personal level, my father certainly was more protective of myself and my sister, I believe, than my brother. So mm -hmm. that's interesting. Um, it's something to be aware of. I don't know. It's just, you know, to some degree, maybe they should be more protective of their daughters. Maybe they should be more proactive. Both parents um, should be more proactive. I mean, I was very influenced. My mom, I lost my mom um, as well. And it's shocking to me that she, you know, she told me things, but it didn't really resonate till after I lost her. But she was only allowed to be a stewardess or a teacher mm -hmm. in the 1960s when no, she was coming up. That was it. Women that were not it. allowed to like buy houses in their name, I think until like 1970 or something. Yeah. And credit cards. They couldn't have a credit card until <laughs> the 1970s. And I will say my father was a big advocate. He made me a homeowner or he encouraged me to be a homeowner by age 23. And maybe that yeah. was part of it, that he didn't want me to have to get married and that did kind he, of stuff. Did he help you financially become a homeowner? He did. And I talk about that in the book. And I think that's really important. Yeah. 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 I was very young, but I will also say it was, a, you talk about New York and privilege it was, um, it was 1993 or four. It was a time when the real estate market was really in the tank. Mm -hmm. And I say in the book, my apartment was $90,000. It's great. So it was not a large sum. So it was, you know, to put down 20%, that's only $18,000. So it was, it was a unique situation where I had not planned to buy a home so much as we weighed. He sat there with me once I got my big job at CNBC and said, well, this is what rent costs. I'm going to have to subsidize you. This is what your mortgage would cost. I would have to subsidize you a lot less, like barely. Right. So let's look at your, you know, your bot mitzvah money. Let's look at what you have mm -hmm. and pull it together. So in that sense, he helped me. Yeah. Um, and there was a quick off ramp, but he helped me also just see the logic of it because we were in this weird real estate moment. Right. Unlike my stepdaughter, where it was expensive. It was really cheap. 90 grand right. is cheap. No, it I mean, that's was, amazing you know. that it's cheap, but I have to say some of that it was cheap. Is the same thing I'm contending with, I feel like. And also yeah. when I was in my thirties, my husband and I were able to help my younger, my brother buy his first place. And I feel like it really set him up. So would you say that that help that your father gave you at 23 was one of the smartest financial things you ever did? It was everything. And it was his idea. Yeah. Because as I said, he did the math on a rental versus ownership in this weird, unique New York moment. I also want to say it was a very small, low floor studio face in the back of the building. Don't this worry, is not, not your dream apartment. You. We're not judging I you. just want to say that. No, but, but I, I now, you know, but, but it's a whole other... I, I have a condo now. I have a grown up condo, you know, right. because of it. From but flipping. A whole other question. It gets into like how we end up feeling apologetic about money, right. which I don't think is good either. Like you're fortunate no. that you made a smart decision and that your father was able to help and you prolate it. Yeah. And that's mm -hmm. smart and yes. Yes, fortunate. No one's denying that. Yeah. But you don't have to apologize for it. Thank I, you. 
No, I I don't mean to apologize, but I do want to put it in perspective that it wasn't that he was subsidizing this grand Park Avenue penthouse. This was an an age appropriate apartment. And that there's one more thing I would like to bring up to that point. One thing that we have trouble with, and this is I and myself and my husband are included in this, is that we have to remember that for many of us in our 20s, we lived an age appropriate and income appropriate lifestyle. We have a hard time accepting that for our children. We want many, many of us want them to live, even if we don't fully understand it, we want them to live at the lifestyle or at least close to the lifestyle that we're at now, right? So that's very tricky. I mean, my husband I, talks I about he lived guilty. in a dump yeah, when he I was young guilty. with many roommates, <laughs> many roommates. And we, we want it to be easier for them. And it's, again, it goes to all these things that are good, but they have consequences. So we want them to be able to eat at a restaurant that we ate at last night, or we want them to go to a show or whatever it may be. Well, I do that's feel an expensive that way. lifestyle. Yeah, okay. I don't feel that way. I've never been one of those parents. But we do that. that. Who like I don't think that they should be able to buy the same clothes I buy or go to restaurants. I do not feel that way. But I I have, I think I do feel a little bit of the like I want to know that they're living in a safe place. I want to know that it's right, you know. Yeah. But you're right. But my husband lived with roommates in a dump. Like he's like there were rats that it was gross. And we just don't really want to tolerate that if we can help. And we perceive ourselves as being able to help if the money is there, but the money isn't always really there. Mm Mm-hmm. Right. So we're choosing like, to allocate it that way. Like part of your core argument is make sure you're taking care of yourself before you're taking care of your adult children. Like at some yeah. point you have to cut it off because you need to be smart about your own finances. Would you say that's accurate? I would say there's gray areas in that. I don't know that you have to cut it off. I think that's a very harsh phrasing. So I'm not comfortable with that phrasing, but you have to prioritize yourself and you have to communicate to them that that's what you're doing. I ran into a writer, Emily Guy Birkin, the other uh, the other day, and she was telling a story about how she really wanted to go in her early 20s to a writer's retreat. And it was X thousand dollars. And she kind of went to her dad, oh, I really want to go to this. What do you think? And he says, well, it sounds great. And she says, well, I'm a little short on cash for it. And he said, oh, well, then I guess you're not going. And that was it. Yeah. That was it. We don't, oh, some of us, I hope some people in the audience have the strength to do that. I, I would have hemmed and hawed. I would say, well, let's think about it. Maybe we, you know, I don't know. I mean, now I've written and read the book. So I, you know, I have the expert stuff. So I'm a little stronger. Like I said, I wrote it for myself, but um, it's hard to just walk away like that. I mean, I was like, wow. And she's like, yep, I just didn't go. Yeah, well, go. That, that I commend that I fully, okay. I fully think kids need to be told you can't afford certain things. It's not my problem. Like I, <laughs> I, in fact, one of my goals right now is to, um, you know, disengage further. I feel like I'm trying to help in certain ways so that I can then just be done. Like, yes. Really cool. Well, and, and, and maybe you sit them down and say, look, I want to be there to help you, but I also need to pivot and really make myself the priority so that I never have to ask you guys for money. Can you help me? You know, and just, I, I hate to say it, but sometimes when they ask like that hint, hint from Emily, let it sit, just let there yeah. be silence. And just say, I love the idea of you going to that. Where, how are you going to fund it? Yeah. Doing more of that is important. That's a good reminder. Yeah. It's hard though. It's hard. We did it recently. We have a 22 year old who's graduating from, um, from NYU Tisch. We're very proud of him. That's great. But he's got a movie he wants to make and he wanted more budget than he had from the school. And he came to us and it was a check that we could have written, but it was a pitch. It, It was a, it was thousands. And I was kind of like, we pay for your college. No, no, no. Yeah, I'm, yeah. I'm kind of silently making eyes at my husband, like, don't go there. Do not, right. do not, you know, cause you kind of, it's tricky when you have a partner to yeah. make sure you, you are on the same page when you're asked it, you know, in the actual situation. And we said, how are you going to raise it? Yeah. And everyone's welcome to go on Indiegogo. It's called meat bell town. You can give Bradley $25 if you want. Uh, we made it, we made a contribution and we suggested that he reach out to people he worked for. Someone he worked for gave him a thousand bucks. You know, people will be generous. I was shocked, happily shocked for him, but it also helped him see, wait, I can raise money. And that's part of being, and you want to be a film producer, lesson. raise you money. Know, I'm, having, I'm having a similar, I have a daughter who's making a documentary film and it's actually about my mother. And she has kind of 
Oh. I, she may have even asked if I would pay, contribute, but she's certainly been hinting. And I've said, absolutely not. Like that's on you to raise that. Yeah. I'm not, I'm yeah. Not I mean, you can gift $25 to her campaign. Sure. Her Indiegogo campaign yeah. or whatever it may be. Sure. Right. But that's it. Yeah. So uh, before we wrap up, I want to talk to you quickly about the real estate market, because there's a question in the audience saying the future of real estate with effects for generations potentially is happening now. Um, making sure properties yeah. stay in families and try to sell to non-cash buyers and individuals, not corporate investors. Just everyone's writing about this, right? She's quoting this Blues, Bloomberg yeah. Business Week article about Wall Street buying starter homes. Where do you see this going? I mean, I know this is not, you're not a forecaster, but do you have opinions about the real estate market and how crazy it is right now in America? I have very strong opinions, mostly from, you know, my background is having been a business news journalist for two decades. And I did cover the housing market economics. I reported for a decade that the Fed did nothing. It was great. So <laughs> I do think that that's a valid concern. I think the idea of these investment companies, these aren't mom and pops, these are companies coming in and buying up tons of houses and then making them into rentals very often or flipping them at very high prices is really scary. Because housing is a unique, you know, I, we call it an investment, but it's really, it's more than an investment. It's our homes. Yeah. It's our homes. And so it's kind of, you know, this is just me personally. It's a little tragic because I think it's making homes inaccessible to so many people. So I hate, I don't have a prediction. I just, I am sad. I'm sad yeah, about that. Really and I hope scary. that we as a society find a solution. I know. I mean, I'm like everyone kind of watching it. I mean, now that interest rates are going up, will it slow down? I have a lot of friends who have been kind of dealing with real estate lately, and it's crazy. Things are going for so much more money over asking. Um, to the question who's asked about the 401k book, it's called The Smartest 401k Book You'll Ever Read by Daniel R. Solin, S-O-L-I-N. And I'm actually definitely going to send that to my oldest daughter. Um, because she's the only one right now, I think, who has a 401k, aside from me. Can I add something? I just want to tell everyone to remind you, the young people in your life that while they absolutely, especially if there's a match, should invest in 401ks, IRAs, all the retirement funds, it's also important, and this came up with Bradley, the 22-year-old, the because he does earn some money doing a lot of content creation. Um, once they've funded, let's say in his case, the Roth IRA, make sure they know that doesn't mean they can't just have a brokerage account. Because a lot of people would get so caught up in these different vehicles that they forget you can just invest. And it's important to also just invest because we want to live our lives, not just our retirement lives. Right. And so encourage your kids. Yes, of course, especially anytime there's a match or a tax advantage that makes sense for them to do that. But also don't be shy about just investing for the now. That's great too. That's a good point. Cause one of my daughters is pretty good at saving on, like she has a 401k and she also puts a percentage of her check into a savings account, which is awesome. Yep. I'm very proud of her, but she does not yet invest that money or know how to invest yeah. it. In way. We, and again, I think particularly with girls, I'm sorry if I sound sexist, but like my son is doing all that stuff. He's the youngest, but the girls kind of steer away from it. And I'm not sure I've done a good enough job at helping them figure it out. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, look, we're so busy telling everyone to save for retirement, but you know, it's important to invest. Maybe they want to buy a house in 10 years or whatever it may be. Maybe they want to just have, have space to do a career pivot. I just, for the first time, it's really hard to do, pulled some money out of an investment to do home renovation. That's okay. Like you don't have to keep everything until the day you retire. It's okay to use money that you've earned through passive investments, whatever it may be for a life when it makes sense, right? It's okay. Right. Live Absolutely. your life. You know, you can take, if you've made a lot of money in the market and you want to spend 10 grand on a great vacation, that's also okay. Someone in the audience is adv advocating don't buy anything on credit except a house, car, or education. I think, I guess I believe that too. I mean, credit cards are just obviously bad. I pay off my credit card bill yeah. every month. Yeah. I mean, you can use them to get points and things like that. And I think it's a convenience in our society these days that, it, and you want to use them to build your credit score, which we know your kids know all about, but you don't want to have credit card debt. And in fact, I actually have a partnership with an app called Tally, which is all about, I feel very passionate about that. They're all about helping people pay off debt in the most efficient way, because it's really a tragedy. I mean, that, that and student debt, I get very emotional about. I think the lack of understanding of how much debt can weigh you down is so upsetting. And I have a lot of feelings about the student loan pause and, and the cost of tuition. 
Yeah. I think it's egregious and it's, oh, and it's a I, burden on students and on parents. Parent loans are a bigger issue than student loans. I agree. And I think it's completely unsustainable. Uh, like I, I think in our lifetime, I think we're going to see that system change somehow. The college. Yeah. It makes no oh, sense. Oh, it's, it makes no sense. And like I said, I'm sitting here, as I said, I've been able to flip up from that first apartment to now I have a beautiful three bedroom condo on the Upper East side of Manhattan. That's all great. Well, we paid for college but barely. And I have to tell you, I'm so, I'm so freaked out by what someone that doesn't have the resources that we have could possibly do other than be burdened for the rest of their life unnecessarily because they just wanted to better themselves or their children. Yeah. That's not morally right. No, you it's, know, it's just yeah. not right. And it starts with the tuition in my mind, not the lenders. It's the tuition. It is. I agree. Student. It's the tuition. And I do think that all state colleges and public universities should be free. I mean, there's. Oh, an that's a no, no brainer, yeah. but the private colleges should bear some responsibility for being fiscally responsible because it, it's just, if a corporation was run that way, it would never succeed. You'd have a, you know, Elon Musk would be coming in to take over or something. No, no, I don't know. Huge endowments. I mean, I think oh. the boarding school like Exeter, I think colleges, I think Harvard, I mean, they have enough money to pay for everyone to go for free forever. I think they have a lot of money. I think Exeter has gone free, completely free. Your oh, app that's, that's cool. I had no idea. I think it has, or it's about to, which is super cool. Yeah. Um, your app is called Tally, T A L L. Tally. Yes. And it's the website is actually meet tally, T-A-L-L-Y, meet tally. I guess they couldn't get tally, but I, full disclosure, I have a partnership with them, but I do have a partnership with them because I believe in them. That's very cool. Yeah. Meet tally. So, okay. Yeah. That's great. All right. So I'm just going to summarize a few of the takeaways, which I think are really great. Um, you want your kids to think that they're competent. You want them to believe in themselves. So you don't want to mm -hmm. rush in to solve every problem. Um, you can't ultimately tell them what to do. And that's really on us to kind of accept some basic, like it's not ultimately up to us. It's up to us to create our own boundaries. Um, teach them to talk to people, right? Common sense, life experience, teach them to reach out. I think that's a really good one. I think that's hard for a lot of kids. Like they learn in college, they get better at talking to adults and, but teaching them like problem solving skills mm -hmm. when they have a money issue is a really good one. Um, and assuming they know things that they don't is another really good one. Like we, we think yeah. they say, they think they know something doesn't mean they know it. And so sometimes we no. have to slow down, which is a little bit. Yes counterintuitive, right? It is a little bit like leaning yeah. into helicopter parenting. Um, it is. But once, you know, you don't have to do it. You teach them once and you don't want them to be embarrassed if they don't understand something. You want them to admit it and be, create an, a, a relationship where they feel comfortable saying, I thought I did, but I really don't. I, I, can you help me with this? You know, I, I don't know how to actually buy renter's insurance. I don't actually know where to start and not get scammed. And I don't know what I really need. So it makes sense to sit down with them the first time, not every time. Yeah, it's really, it's a lot. I mean, they I now have memories of my children getting scammed by various things are coming back to me. I mean, it's uh, a lot. The world, there's a lot to learn and it's a lot as a parent yeah. to be on top of them and help them and know that you can't be there for everything and you can't prevent yeah. everything. And, um, and we've been scammed. I mean, I'm sitting here now, we're, we're having this discussion. All these memories are coming back to me of stupid things that I did when I was young that I wish my parents had warned me about better. But again, we were latchkey kids. I mean, we, I didn't get that kind of supervision like we do no, with our actually, kids. I really friend, didn't. A friend said something really interesting to me today. I told her that I was going to be interviewing you this afternoon. Oh. And she said, the last person I would want financial advice is from my mother. And she loves her mother, but she said she grew up like with very poor financial role models and has done it all herself. And, okay. uh, and that was another interesting perspective, yeah. right? Like, maybe we yeah, have to I, ourselves and like, are we the best financial role models? <laughs> you know? But then, but, but you have a third party advisor that's willing to step in. And what I would say is, just like you want them to be honest when they don't understand something, you do the same and yeah. then look it up together. Yeah. Just I like mean, the person in the chat. Who yeah. Said, I don't know what she, she yeah. should be investing in her 401k. So yeah. Understanding. So say not. that, but figure it out. And the truth is that we did not have the resources that they do right now. All you have to do is help them figure out where the best source of information is. It's probably not discord or Reddit. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That, but you're, but you're, here with these but your financial professional probably has a lot of resources on their web page even you know the major mainstream places whether it's schwab fidelity vanguard you can get in there 
even probably without an account, but even with a very small account and get a wealth of so much amazing information that you can use to educate yourself. Even I hate to say this, but irs.gov has a lot of information. If you don't understand a 529 and what the difference is between that and a UTMA, go to, go to irs.gov. They will answer your questions. If you don't you know, understand don't the, the child tax done. credit, <laughs> IRS, it's a great website, Nina. It's actually, it's like the one government thing that is so well done. Really? I, I, literally, yes. I don't think I've ever been on the IRS website. All right. I'm going to. My- so well, it's so well done. It's so clear. It's the best. Any and most, all those gibberishy numbers, they're named after tax codes. So that's like, yeah. So like, you don't understand what's a 401k. It's like code 401k. It's like, it's like rule number 401k or something like that. And if you go into the irs.gov and search for 401k, you'll find how it works what the limits are, because every year the limits of how much you can contribute change. And for Mm -hmm. many of us, if you're over a certain age, you can contribute more. So that information is all at irs.gov. And I am not in partnership with (laughs) irs.gov. I wouldn't expect you were. That's just so you know. (laughs) Very, very good to know. Um, But yeah. And are you working on a next book? Have you enjoyed writing this book? What's next for you? I would love everyone's suggestions. Um, I do have an idea, but right now I just, this book just came out and I'm excited to have as many people read it as possible and be in touch if you are picking it up and you have questions. I'm on all the social channels and all that and be in touch if you have questions or if you have just thoughts about the yeah, book. And, and Bobby has a great website. Do you want to tell us what it is? It's just Bobby. Sure. Rebell. Yeah. It's my name, Bobby Rebell. So it's B-O-B-B-I-R-E-B-E-L-L on all the socials. I am at Bobby Rebell, except for Instagram. There's a number one after Bobby Rebell, but you'll find me. And please get on my newsletter, which you can do on the website. I am available to speak to your group. If you are looking for a speaker, I would love to drop into your book club. And I would just love to hear from anyone that's that's touched by the book. Just be in touch whatever way makes sense for you. That's great. I mean, it's a really great subject and we don't have enough. I mean, we have a group on Revel for a, a support group that I'm involved in called for parents of adult children. And we spend a lot of our time talking about money issues and how to help and when not to help and when to say no. And it's just really a very important subject. Um, Thank you. By the way, there's a wait list for that. I tried to come. <laughs> Oh, well, there's we should, a wait we need, list. I know we need to set up more. We need you. You should start one yourself. Like we, there should be like dozens of these because it's so useful. We meet every other week and we talk about. I mean, everything you could possibly imagine. Like there's a woman in it whose son has just come out. You know, there are all these issues yeah. that we're all grappling yeah. with. It really does it, help. It is. It is complicated. Yeah, my my brother, by the way, just happens to be gay and he's married to a wonderful man, and that that's complicated. Different financial stuff. I'm so happy that marriage is legal now because that protects my brother. Um, but yeah, that's a money, that's actually a money thing, believe it yeah. or not. I mean, it's, um, it's very important to me as his big sister that he has that protection of legal marriage. Yeah, um, well, so this is all so many, stuff. So many emotional issues intersect with money stuff. Like my son getting married, yeah. there are the issues around him getting married and the new mm-hmm. daughter-in-law and the dress and all the stuff. <laughs> and then there's the financial issue of who's paying for it. Yeah. And how, how much do I offer? Yes. And yeah. It's a lot, a lot of complicated stuff. Yeah. So, it um, is. Really lovely to meet you. Thank you so much, everyone. This um, session will come out as our podcast, Raging Gracefully, on Friday. It'll also be in our newsletter on Sunday. Um, Marnie in the audience says, you could have an entire topic on boomerang kids and how long they can stay with you. Yes, indeed. Yes. I read read a moment during COVID where I was like, I can't remember the stages, but I, I was like, New York is in stage three and it's time for you to leave. <laughs> Whatever it was, I was like, <laughs> so yes. Yeah. It yes. Was having them home. And it was also complicated. Yes. Yeah. Yes. All right. Loved meeting you, Bobby. We will do things in the future, I'm sure. And thank you to all of our participants and um, everyone have a great evening. Thank you. Thank you everyone for all of your comments. All right. Take care. Bye-bye.